So in this mini lecture, I'll introduce you to Omi and Wynand's racial formation theory, which they also refer to as the new racial theory. In our previous mini lecture, we talked about the take home points from the film Race the Power of an Illusion. And if you remember, one of the main ideas is that there is no biological basis to race. That race is a socio-historical construct, and yet racism is very real in its consequences, right? So Omi and Wynand present their racial formation theory. Um, it is a very influential theory within sociology of race. And in many ways, they are responding to this idea uh, in pop culture, which was that we are post-racial, right? In many ways, we've built it up to a mythology that, hey, we did the civil rights movement, we are done with racism, race is no longer relevant, right? And Omi and Wynand are making the assertion that race continues to be significant, right? And they're trying to answer and say, well, how is it that despite having moved several decades beyond the civil rights movement, race is more significant than ever. We see this evidence in the educational gap, the wealth gap, police brutality, mass incarceration, discrimination at work. And they provide a conceptualization of race that helps us understand why race continues to be significant. And in fact, they're pointing out that race is always changing. In fact, it has to in order to endure, right? It's a social historical construct. It changes from one place to another, from one period of time to another. And that's why last time we were talking about the example of the Irish Americans who turn of the century were racialized, caricatured, and if you fast forward to 2020, they are considered part of the white mainstream. Same thing with Italian Americans. Um, and the case study that I assigned to you from Brodkin illustrates this point really well of how the Jewish turn of the century were seen as non-white, but were gradually whitened and became part of the mainstream. Um, so the idea then is that depending on political circumstances, historical circumstances, each group is racialized in different ways, right? For instance, Chinese Americans at the turn of the century were seen as coolies, right? That's the slur that was used for this group. They were seen as good for manual labor good for doing laundry, right? That characterization has changed dramatically today when they're seen as the model minority, as good techies, right? Good with computers and math. So racialization then changes over time. In present times, you could see that what is considered black in Brazil or in England is very different from what we consider black in the US. That's why you have the image over there of um, Susie Phipps and Omi and Wine and use her example to point out that she actually petitioned to be recognized as white and her request was denied. Race is that arbitrary. Right? There, there's no biological genetic basis for assigning race. Okay? In our own history, um, the particular characterization of racial identity in the U.S. is based on the one-drop rule, the law of hyperdescent. That's very peculiar to the U.S., right? where many folks of mixed race heritage, right? of mixed heritage, are often classified as black. Um, and that law of hypodescent took a while to establish. So there was that window in our history 
where you could literally cross state lines and change your race. Because one state was saying that if you were one sixteenth of African origin, then you're black. Another state was saying if you're one eighth of African origin, then you're black. So literally you could cross state lines and change your racial identity. And this is what we keep assigning, um, asserting that race is much more about the meanings we attribute to the skin color than the actual skin color. Right. Um, and so something that seems so rigid and obvious really isn't. It has no essence. Right. So even though we keep saying Barack Obama is our first black president, the reality is that he's half white and half black. Right. Um, this is what we mean by hegemony. Right. So racial hegemony is imagining our world as already objective, taken for granted, the racial hierarchy is taken for granted, the identities we ascribe to folks, right, seem so obvious that we forget that they are socially constructed and that they uphold and perpetuate a particular racial hierarchy. So if you remember, hegemony is ideological, right? And Omi and Wynand are pointing out that it's the racial state's job to re-articulate racial hegemony, right? The idea that racism has several different iterations, right? So as we think that racial formations are changing based on historical circumstances, the racial state has the job of maintaining status quo so as we pass the emancipation proclamation slavery is abolished right but we institute the black codes which means black folks can now be arrested on mass for things like loitering vagrancy right and the same folks who were enslaved are now made to work on these chain gangs they're put behind bars. That's why the documentary 13th that's available on Netflix is really educational in terms of seeing all these different manifestations of racism over time. Just as you're thinking things have changed, right? We re-articulate racial status quo through our government, through our laws, court decisions, our educational system, etc. You have the Fair Housing Act that was enacted, but then you have the federal appraisal system of redlining that led to residential segregation, right? And perpetuated this huge wealth gap as well as a racialized educational gap, right? Um, the third thing that Omi and Wynan are pointing out is that race is an organizing principle at the micro level in terms of how it shapes uh, our micro level interactions, as well as an organizing principle at the macro level of shaping our institutions, such as mass media, the educational system, criminal justice system, and so on. At the micro level, the evidence for this that they present is how we commit faux pas or little stumbles in our interactions. So for instance, you go into Kaiser Prominente and you encounter a black woman there and your immediate assumption is this must be the assistant. And you're looking around for the physician to show up because you've mistakenly assumed that she cannot possibly be the physician. And so the way this operates is that you're not necessarily imagining yourself as a bigoted person, but race is an organizing principle in how it shapes our stereotypes and assumptions about people in our interactions. Similarly, it shapes things at the macro level as well. Right? And Omi and Wine, in fact, call these racial projects, right? Whether it's our housing policy or mass incarceration, or more recently, 
we did away with SATs for the UCs because scholars had been pointing out again and again how this is exacerbates the racial equity gap in our higher education, right? So the racial state consists of the government, its laws, court decisions, and it determines the trajectory of race relations. The racial state is the common facilitator of the micro and macro level processes, and its job is to maintain status quo and re-articulate the racial hegemony. The case study that illustrates Omi and Wynan's idea of racial formation theory is Brodkin's case study of Jewish immigrants. So Karen Brodkin is a second generation Jewish American. She's growing up in an immigrant family and she's hearing these stories growing up from her first generation parents of how they came to the US with nothing and they worked really hard and achieved success. So it's a fairly typical immigrant story when you think about it, the bootstraps mythology. All you have to do is pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and work really hard and you can achieve the American dream, right? That's the myth of American meritocracy, that all you need is merit. Right? And then nothing can stop you. And Brodkin says growing up, as she starts to put together the pieces of this puzzle, she says some parts of the story were missing. Right? And she says, turn of the century, the Jewish were in this strange position of being in the middle, having this double vision, neither black nor white. Right? And what ends up happening with the end of World War II is that the Jewish are able to gain upward mobility. She describes it as a chicken and egg where the more middle class they became, the whiter they got, the more white they became, easier it became to achieve middle class status, right? So race and class emerging simultaneously, and they had a couple of other things that helped them. One is they had relevant skill sets. So they had factory skills that were very useful in a newly manufacturing economy. And also the federal government invested a lot in suburbanization. Um, after World War II, it was really not fashionable to be anti-Semitic op openly. Previously, we had been very anti-Semitic. And so all of these different factors helped them gain upward mobility, even though she qualifies that with the new essay she wrote in 2016 that we are observing a re-racialization of Jewish Americans with old style anti-Semitism, which we thought we were done with but it's back in full swing with swastikas and everything. Um, she goes in depth into talking about the GI Bill, which was the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, more popularly known as the GI Bill. And in many ways, the GI Bill was revolutionary because it made home ownership possible for millions of white Americans who had been working class but could now achieve middle class status. And the GI Bill was comprehensive. It made education possible. It gave you a stipend while you were looking for work. And most importantly, it made available low interest home loans. Right? So for the first time, your mortgage payment could be lower than your rent. Right? And the federal government invested a lot in the suburban tracts. So she calls it the biggest and best affirmative action program because this was made available only to European males. And she's pointing that out, that somehow we have historical amnesia when we, when we consider the advantages enjoyed by the white population, right? 